Hey everybody and welcome to another lecture in the social psych lecture series. This is lecture three. We are going to be talking about social cognition in this episode. So strap in, hope you like the uh, comic, and let's talk about social cognition. Again, this is going to be a little quick and a little shorter cut, basically. Um, there's going to probably be some aspects from surrounding chapters here today uh, for this video. But uh, I'll try to try to give you a, a solid outline here for what it is we plan to do. All right. So what is social cognition? We talked a little bit, a bit about it in the last episode uh, in lecture two. So we'll go through some key features. We'll talk a little bit more about schemas with re with respect to just social cognition in general. Again, that should be review from uh, a little bit in lecture two. And then we'll go into a little bit of priming and, and accessibility of memories and how priming works. Confirmation bias, again, told you it was going to be a lot, uh, a lot of mentioning of confirmation bias just over and over and over again. And then and then um, just to, to round us out, we are going to go over a few other social cognitive effects here and there. I kind of like it. Things like self-fulfilling prophecy, that sort of thing. So stick around. Stay tuned. So the first thing I want to talk about is what is social cognition? And one of the good ways to do that is to talk about the five critical aspects of social cognition. OK, so. Social cognition. In and of itself is the study of how people think about their social world and arrive at judgments that help interpret the past, understand the present and predict the future. OK, so interpret the past understand the present and predict the future. Okay, so let's go over these five aspects. So the first one for how we make sense of the world and how we make sense of things that are uh, happened, are happening or will happen to us. So our first one, our judgments are only as good as the info upon which they are based. Yet the info available to us is not always accurate or complete. I really dislike making decisions when I don't have all the information. I, I could I could have made a decision if you had just given me all the information from the start, people. Uh, and so we rarely have these resources, this external information, the internal resources to make every decision as thorough as we could. And so one of the ways we move through life is uh, a term called cognitive misery cognitive misery uh so this is cognitive shortcuts because we lack the information we understand our limitations we lack the motivation for processing information around us okay so we're under an amount of cognitive load at any given time and so in order to reduce that load for some kinds of decisions, we ignore information, we overuse information, and we settle on less than perfect alternatives. Okay. Uh, and we'll go over some of those shortcuts, uh, either to in this video or in future videos like heuristics, stereotypes or schemas. Okay, number two, the way in which info is presented can affect our judgments. So all judgments are relative. So they have a starting point and they are based on that starting point. OK, we, these are we can call these reference points. I'll talk a little bit more about uh, reference points and contrasting when we get it to priming later in this video. But I do have an example for you just to just to round this number out. A very expensive bottle of wine on a menu at a restaurant may lead us to accept a less expensive but moderately high priced bottle as reasonable. Always go bottom shelf. That's just me. We may not have made this assessment, however, if we never saw the very expensive bottle price first, like Ooh, that's $100. No, let's go for the $80 bottle of wine. What? And so there's uh, so we could call this an example of anchoring, which is a heuristic that we use when we 
uh, make judgments uh, of amounts, okay, and costs and things like that. There are evidence, uh, there's uh, bits of evidence to suggest how this works. The Charlie's Angles study, Charles Angles, excuse me, males rated potential blind dates as less attractive after they viewed the TV show compared to a control that rated the potential dates before the show. So control group rated the potential by blind dates before they saw Charlie's Angels. Um, and uh, the other group of males rated the blind dates after they rated. And so less attractive after watching um, what is considered beautiful women, at least from the perspective of Charlie's Angels. Okay. Number three. We don't just passively take info in. We seek it out, and often in a biased way. Confirmation bias. Again, this is confirmation bias through and through. So we are um, going to hammer that one in. Okay. Number four, our pre-existing knowledge and expectations can influence how we construe new information. Um, this is a fancy way of saying top-down processing. So we take what we know in our heads... And we use that to shape new information that comes into our senses, okay? And, and and this is how perception works in general. So you see a shadow at night and you're like, oh, what's that shadow? I'm going to try to figure out what that shadow is so I don't get scared or if it's something that I do need to be afraid of and so I can run away or whatever. Um, so that's what top-down processing is, taking everything that we know and we expect in the world and then applying it to all the new information that we come across on a day-to-day -day basis. And number five, how do we make sense of the world? Both reason and intuition underlie social cognition, whose complex interactions affect judgments. So are we rational? This is a really big question. We'll talk about attribution theory in the next video. Okay. Uh, and so we'll we'll talk about a specific model by Kelly that was developed by Kelly. Um, but to answer the question, are we rational? Well, I like to think of it as uh, do we do things in attainment of our own goals? Yeah, sure. That's rational. If we do things that help us achieve our goals, whatever those goals may be, our decisions if they help us to uh, achieve our goals, then that's rational. When we do things that are antithetical to those goals, then no, though that is what's considered irrational, okay? And so these five things are used to create our social world. I think I mentioned in the um, lecture one of this video series that objective reality doesn't exist. We all socially construct it. It doesn't. I hate to break it to you, but it doesn't exist. And so we have to uh, figure out how our social world works. And the five ways that we think about our social world are these five ways. Okay. All right. Um, I do want to mention this because it's going to be part of an activity that I'm going to do during the live stream portion for this class. But one of the ways we think about um, the past has to do with um, how we think about alternatives to our past. What could have been? What, um, what were the possibilities that could have been? So this is literally th thinking counter to fact. So you already know what did happen. So let's think about what could have happened. So that's counterfactual thinking. And um, uh, again, it's going to be for an activity. So if you want to know what that activity is, just leave a, a message in the comments. Below. OK, so let's go through the key features of social cognition. We're going to do we're going to talk about three sources of input. Those three sources of input are the characteristics of the stimuli. So that's the first one. So objective features and objective here is quote unquote 
Okay. So what are the what are the physical properties of the stimuli that we're looking at? And so we'll talk about we'll we'll talk about it in the sense of uh, these are um, people. So we'll call them a target. How about that? So the features of the target or the target's behavior, the information that we get. What's the person actually doing? What can we see with our own eyeballs? Right. So winks as winks, a laugh recognized as a laugh and a limp recognized as a limp. OK, so these are behaviors that we can observe and they're generally speaking objective enough that um, there's very little. Um, there's very little issue. There's little issue with the. Misinterpretation, that's what I wanted to say. Very little issue with with the um, with misinterpretation. The characteristics of the perceiver is the second key feature. OK, so that's you perceiving other people. So the characteristics of the perce perceiver, cognitive, motivational, affective states or traits. Affective is just a fancy word for emotion. So um, it could be emotional states. So these are usually chronic or stable. So chronic uh, or excuse me, they're chronic and stable or they're temporary. OK, so those are expect chronic stable things are expectations, stereotypes, personalities, temporary things are like moods, goals. OK, most of what we perceive. is filtered through our existing expectations and schemas, like I said uh, when we talked about the um, components. So features of the perceiver, whether they're stable or unstable, change how we see the world. It's the lens by which we watch the world and get information about it. So it's always going to be colored through that. So imagine, for example, your partner wants to spend the evening with his or her or their friend, how much how might your self esteem change the way this objective event is perceived? Right? There's nothing misinterpretable about I want to go hang with my friends. Um, but imagine if self esteem ch changes, wiggles around. There you go. That's it. That changes it, right? What happens, though, if you instead of viewing it as a stable trait like self-esteem, you view it after a really bad day at work or school versus a really good day, right? So that's something that's temporary, that's unstable, that may change your judgment in the moment because of that, but it wouldn't be affected if it wasn't that, if that makes sense. And the last one is characteristics of the context. So the situation. Remember, we said that the situation is fairly powerful to change our cognitions, to change our behaviors. So these are inf this is information, cues or triggers that provide information on how to interpret specifically ambiguous events. So ambiguous events is very important here. We have to interpret these ambiguous events because we don't they can have multiple meanings what ambiguous is, right? So we need to use these cues or triggers to let us know. So for example, let's go back to the wink that I mentioned for characteristics of the stimuli. So if you're at home, a wink means something quite different than a wink at work. At least we hope so, right? Mm. On the other hand, another example, your partner wants to go out with their friends after an argument versus no argument. OK, so the cue or trigger to hanging out with friends is the argument or potentially not the the uh, not hanging out with friends because of no argument. So there are a number of ways that um, the in the situation, the context can change the way we think. About certain things. Um, I want to take a brief foray 
into automatic versus controlled processing. Now, this is a dichotomy that's still up, to, up for debate. Uh, we can call automatic processes type 1 and controlled processes type 2. I'm trying not to attach too much stuff to automatic versus control processing, except that Let's add some adjectives to automatic versus control processing. So automatic processing is unintentional. It's involuntary for the most part. It's effortless, or at least it should be. And generally speaking, it's outside of our own awareness. So we're not conscious of it. Okay, so that's all fast. It's very fast. And we're, we're talking relatively fast. So even... And so you know, a second, maybe even less. Control processes, on the other hand, is intentional, okay? It's voluntary, it's effortful, and it's with awareness. A lot of the times, researchers like to lump in working memory for control processes, and this is our, our stat state of awareness, or working memory. We're constantly working with information, that's coming in, that's being drawn in from long-term memory, and so this is our state of consciousness. And so maybe there's a distinction there. It's nice. Um, this automatic versus control processing falls under the umbrella of dual process theories. There's a lot of dual process uh, theorizing um, and it's been going on for a long time. There is uh, stuff in social psychology, in the social cognitive literature, and then there's stuff in cognitive psychology in the cognitive psych literature. Uh, I actually did that for my dissertation, and um, it's a fascinating literature. Again, these are really great philosophical and psychological questions, and they're, and they're still, like I said, up for debate. But one of the things that I mentioned at the top of this video is heuristics, right? It's part of the way that we, um, it's part of the way that we uh, think about the world, and we and we can do this rapidly. These are shortcuts, right? And here's the thing: this is what happens when we encounter a new problem or a new situation, a new adaptive pressure, for example. We need to figure out the problem and how to solve it. So we do that algorithmically uh, quite a bit, okay? But once we get the hang of the algorithm, we start taking it faster and faster and faster and faster. We lose all of that uh, need for all those cognitive resources. We get rid of it. And so this control, what was once a controlled process is now a, an automatic process. So automaticity is this is the answer to this du again the animation was backwards there my bad okay so dual process theory simplified okay so let's talk about a couple of these heuristics um i'm only gonna uh, talk about a couple and then we're gonna move on so because i don't want to bore you with my research so like i said this is an algorithm versus heuristic right so a couple of the common per, uh, common heuristics uh, include availability heuristic. And you have likely encountered the availability heuristic, even if you didn't put it to name. OK, so it's it's the idea. It's the shortcut, the mental shortcut of how quickly examples for something come to mind. OK, so this is about accessibility and availability of information. Okay. The easier something is to come to mind, the more typical we believe that to be an example of the situation. So let me let me let me give you some some uh, good examples. OK. If you are afraid to fly because you are you recognize um, all the times plane crashes are discussed, I mean, we spend so much time in the news talking about plane crashes, especially with the Boeing 737 MAX, right? That the recent, uh, back in 2018, 2019, there were two big plane crashes and there were issues with that plane. And you're like, I don't want to fly anymore. 
because, you know, my plane could crash. Well, that's an example of the availability heuristic because it's actually statistically more likely that you will die in a car accident than a plane accident. Statistically speaking, flying in a plane, not flying a plane, but flying in a plane as a passenger is safer than riding in a car and the passenger in a car, not the one driving, riding as a passenger in a car. It's more safer, more safer. It's the most safe form of travel. It's safer than trains, boats. You know, you could drown in a boat. Uh, you're very close to the water and and cars and automobiles and, and trucks and things like that. So that's the availability heuristic, this this fear that comes from seeing the news reports, because we think plane crashes are more common than car crashes. But that is way far. Like, you know, only uh, a dozen or so plane crashes, maybe even fewer than that, happen each year. That's a big estimate, by the way. It's a very gross estimate. Um, whereas tens of thousands of car accidents, even hundreds of thousands of car accidents may occur in any given year across. And I'm just talking about the United States worldwide. That's like hundreds of thousands of car accidents and, and probably only a dozen plane accidents. And so we hear about them quite a bit more frequently. And so we think they're more frequent. OK. Um, it's easier to think of male presidents of Fortune 500 companies, because there are more. Uh, it's easier to think of famous Russian novelists than Norwegian ones, even though <laughs> even though they're a good, good amount of numbers. Uh, and so a lot of the times we just think about, oh, what's the quickest, easiest thing to think about? OK, that's the most typical. There's a good clip from The Daily Show that um, is a good example of the availability, availability heuristic, and that is the Summer of the Shark clip from, I want to say 2003, 2000, 2003, somewhere in there, um, where Stephen, when Stephen Colbert was still on The Daily Show. So you can find that online if you want. The other one that I want to talk about is the representativeness heuristic. So the representativeness heuristic is the idea that we categorizing and group things that we encounter in our lives based on their properties and their resemblance to groups we are and categories we already have in our brain. So if something resembles a group or category we already have, we're going to plop that in there. So if we come up across a, uh, a particular item A and it resembles group B, then we're going to put A into group B. And we're like, oh, yeah, that, that's, that's right. Um, this is one of the ways that stereotypes, generally speaking, um, perpetuate. We just, we just keep thinking about how various characteristics of people fill categories we already have, whether it's true or not. We already think of people and put them into the groups that we already have. So, for example, we have an, a have an idea of what a secretary is, or we can call them an administrative assistant. We have an idea of what they look like. So people will be more likely to assume a person named Tom is the boss and a person named Mary is the secretary than the other way around, because Tom is a man's name and Mary is a woman's name. And man and woman are genderized to boss and, and secretary, respectively. So we don't ask ourselves, what are the odds that Tom is the secretary and Mary is the boss? Or what is the odd? What are the odds that Tom fits my idea of what a secretary is? Um, and so sometimes it's true. Sometimes it provides useful information. Quick categorization for first impressions. OK. It's a problem when we just keep that going. That's where the stereotype comes in. Okay, It becomes problematic when we take an initial trait such as something like gender or ethnicity, and we use that to, to shape the way we think of someone when we first meet them. Okay. So when do we use, when do we use these things? 
We use them when we don't have time to think carefully about any issues. We'll go into a little bit more detail about that with persuasion. When we are overloaded with information. So when type two thinking is overloaded and we have to be very deliberative about that stuff, then we are going to have problems. Okay. When the issue is not very important to us, again, persuasion. Uh, we're going to go into more detail with that. And then we have little solid knowledge or information to use, which we'll is use what we have. Five conscious ways, or excuse me, five ways the unconscious is smart. So I use unconscious here broadly. We could we could talk about type one. A we, we can throw this into a little bit of type one. Um, so automatic processing, if you want to take unconscious, unconscious and replace it with type one or automatic processing. So it motivates. Uh, it, it Sorry, the motives that guide us often operate un unconsciously, right? So our memory consolidation occurs during sleep. Want, mind wandering can help generate creative ideas, things like brainstorming and just letting your mind go and travel whatever stream of consciousness it's on. Intuition can facilitate sound decisions and unconscious emotional associations can promote beneficial decisions. So that's what's called the somatic marker hypothesis. So these are uh, five important ways that automatic thinking assists us in our day to day lives. All right, let's jump into schemas. This should be a review if you watched lecture two's video. I'll link that above. Schemas are cognitive building blocks. So that, again, they're the way that we organize information that we have acquired throughout our lives. So it's a conceptual mental structure. It's not a physical structure in your brain. brain. It's a cognitive, conceptual structure. And it's all based on what we've acquired in our daily lives. Okay. So what's part of schemas? Well, those schemas are scripts. Okay. So scripts are schemas for events and impressions are schemas for people. So where do we get these from? Well, it's just a way that our cognitive architecture works in order to categorize the information because we encounter lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of information on a day to day basis. We need to be able to categorize it. Otherwise, we're just going to have random information everywhere and we don't know we wouldn't know where to access it, where to get it, what to do with the information. So the idea we have with schemas is that, yes, they're human universals, but the way that they are used and built is that they are culturally universal. So not all cultures use schemas or have schemas in the same way as other cultures. Which is, I think, on a pretty important point, OK, um, because the schemas are shaped by cultural experiences. OK. So where are the what are these experiences? Well, that's direct contact with people, events and ideas. Uh, a lot of those being our parents and our siblings and our close family members. Indirect contact with parents, teachers, peers, books, newspapers, magazines, television, the Internet. These are all indirect exposure. And our culture is shaped by all of these things, especially books, newspapers, magazines, television, the Internet. OK. And then we can throw in some cultural universals about how in emotion is used. Emotion is used for these things. So, for example. Uh, we we have the schema of how to operate at a funeral. OK, well, we have the script, I guess. The script to operate at a funeral. We're supposed to be somber. We're supposed to be sad. Um, really laughing and joking is. I, I'll say just broadly speaking, frowned upon unless a joke is offered by people close to the one who was lost. Right. You shouldn't if you didn't really know the person, you shouldn't be sittering, snickering in the back of the uh, church, wherever the funeral is being held. She can be like, <laughs> that person died. Yeah, no, we're not. We don't do that at funerals because that's obviously rude and obnoxious. 
right? And so the somber thing, this this emotion is part of the event. But that not really the same in other cultures. Other cultures celebrate death and they're happy and they're they're joyous that this person has now joined with um spirituality whatever the idea of the afterlife is in these cultures they're just they're 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 celebration uh involved with funerals as opposed to how westerners view funerals being like oh this is the end of your life on earth sort of thing we're sad right so that's that's how uh, emotion, for example, is used with schemas. Okay, so how do they work? Well, this is a bridge to priming. So the way schemas work is they have to be accessible. Okay, And when you access a schema and the, the memories associated with the schema and the knowledge and the information associated with these schemas. It's sort of like a spreading activation. I'll I have a, an image here on the next slide that um, uh, is part of my fandom geekdom sort of thing, my nerddom. So the idea of accessibility is the ease at which you bring an idea into consciousness, right? So how, how surface level uh, in your memory, how, often do you access it um things are more accessible the more you access them does it make sense the more you think about them the more they become accessible and the less you think about things the less they become accessible uh, accessible excuse me an aspect of a schema that is active in one's mind consciously or not colors perception and behavior this is the salience of the information, okay? Accessibility is tied to unconscious processing. That unconscious processing occurs even before you know that you're accessing a schema. The, access the accessibility feature here is called priming. Priming increases the salience of a schema and makes it more accessible. And a lot of the times this is done without your knowledge because this is like automatic type one thinking. Okay, so for example, imagine you're a, you're a fan of Star Wars episodes, let's we'll say three through six. And uh, Clone Wars and Rebels. <laughs> so when you think about Star Wars, this entire associative network explodes out of it. Because you're thinking, and this was created before the Disney uh, 789 series, so you can just see episodes 1, 2, and 3, episodes 4, 5, and 6. I don't think 1, 2, and 3 are terrible, nor were they too commercial. I thought that just George Lucas had, was playing around with toys that didn't really help the story, maybe. Um, but Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones have grown on me a little bit more than they did when they came out, you know, 20 some years ago. Four, five, and six, always great. All right. So this entire spreading activation, you go from four, five, six, amazing. Worn off VHS labels. I still have the VHS for four, five, six on my shelf over there. Bye bye VHS because VHS doesn't exist anymore. Well, I mean, VCRs do exist, but who has that, right? So, you know, the, all of this information comes to you. It becomes more salient because it's accessible. The more you think about Star Wars, the more you think about this schema and these associative networks. So this is from, um, by the way, this image, is, this, this image is from Joseph Herta. Joseph Herta. Let me give you an example of this one. Okay. So Higgins and colleagues did a study where they primed participants with a positive impression or a negative impression or a mixed impression of a person named Donald. Okay. I do have to say this is not Donald Trump. This study came well before, uh, well before all of this stuff from 2015 onward. So this is just a random fictitious dude who was given po a bunch of positive traits to the participant, a bunch of negative traits to um, to the participant, 
and a mixed impression. But before they were given that, before they were given that, they were primed with either positive or negative aspects of somebody they are about to meet. They didn't know they were being primed with this information. It's just, it was just a bunch of adjectives that they had to um, try to remember in a just like a, a memory task. So they were given that task first. And then afterward, they were given the full um, workup of Donald and who he was. It was either positive, negative or mixed. OK. So here we have positive people or positive people. Uh, here we have primed with positive adjectives. And this is people who were given the positive impression of Donald. And so the percentage of participants reporting each type of impression, right? So 70% of the people were like, oh, yeah, he's a cool dude. I'd like to meet that guy. Whereas a very few people with the negative impression were like, mm, no, that's not this. No, 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 no. Those two things didn't mix. And then mix was about 20%. Okay, so that sums to 100. Same over here. This sums to 100 as well. So you can see that it essentially is reversed. Mixed people don't change, which is what you want to see. But positive and negative switch, flip. Okay. So the idea here is impressions are dependent on traits that are accessible or primed before meeting Donald. So if you got positive information about Donald, or if you got negative information about Donald, that's going to shape the way that you see Donald when you meet him. Even if you didn't realize that you were being primed with this information. Now, I think that's the I think that's the coolest thing about this is that they didn't know this is all automatic processing. Imagine how much automatic processing you do for all of the things in your life. Right. We're going to talk a, a lot about this um, when we get to stereotyping prejudice and discrimination with the current events, because I am recording this in June 2020. The current events are pretty damn on point for this. I this <laughs> keep pointing the wrong way. This idea. We have all of this stereotypic information that is accessible to us. And when we meet somebody new that is of a different race, of a different gender, of a different ethnicity, etc., that information clouds our impression. It shapes and colors our impression because it's accessible. That's uh, bad news bears for making completely free of bias uh, impressions. Priming, however, requires um, a, 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 a temporal connectedness to it. OK, so you can see here I wrote recently primed unconscious schemas recently. Priming, generally speaking, loses its luster once you start thinking about other things. And so when you do a priming style study, you basically have to do the priming, the unconscious saliency of the information, and then you have to like get behavioral data immediately so self-report whatever it's like the meeting donald thing on the last slide right these are called subliminal priming is this is also called subliminal priming you can call it all things like automatic priming unconscious priming these these words generally speaking go together um however they're they're not it's not ironclad there is some light at the end of the tunnel everyone it's not ironclad. It does not lead to automatic compliance. You just like, Loop, I was programmed. I am American Ultra. I will harm anyone you want me to. It weren't, it's not Bucky Barnes, the Winter Soldier, because after we get a, a series of, of words, that's a, that's a deep cut for my, my Marvel fans over here. So we, we, we're not automatons in that case, right? We're not brainwashed or programmed uh, when we get primes. A lot of times they don't work. Some of the priming literature is actually not replicating these days. So keep that in mind. Okay. Priming will make ideas more accessible than others. And it's more effective 
if the following events are a bit ambiguous, multiple meanings. And so when you search for meaning, because that is the human existence, searching for meaning 100% of the time, we are going to use the information that is accessible and salient to us, and that might be the prime that just occurred, right? This does backfire, though, sometimes. If you know that you're being your 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 target of priming, you may actually end up with a contrast and you're like, mm -mm, I'm not going to play your game. I'm not going to play your game. So if you're being primed by the word reckless, for example, and then you meet somebody, um, you might just go, wait a minute. These people aren't reckless. It could just be the opposite. Right. These these people aren't reckless. They can't be reckless. OK, so contrast effect is uh, the behavioral response. That is opposite to the intent of the priming. OK, so conditions uh, under which this occurs, awareness of primed information, it's a potential effect. So if you're going to do a priming study, you really have to make sure that um, you are deceiving uh, your participants in a un in an ethical way of course but you're deceiving them they don't they don't actually get any demand characteristics for what it is that you're trying to measure that's important that's very important um it might occur when you're trying to do extreme primes so i have an example for you and uh if the prime evokes a specific category example so for example if um, if you are uh, in a study and you assimilate, uh, it, people can assimilate the concept intelligence and perform better when primed, excuse me, with the category professors like Al over here, rather than the category supermodel. Um, Poliva, I think this is Polina. Oh no, yeah, Polina Portskova, I think something like that, or Claudia Schiffer, somebody. It's somebody leave leave, leave um, the information in the comments down below. I don't remember. So, oh, it is. It's Claudia Schiffer, actually. <laughs> so. That's how the normal study works. But let's say you specifically prime people with Albert Einstein and you specifically prime people with Claudia Schiffer. Then you get contrast effects. So you get the good prime if you just use professors and supermodels. You don't get the, the intended prime when you use Albert Einstein or Claudia Schiffer because when you see Albert Einstein, like me, you think to yourself, wow, I'm not as smart as he is. And so, yeah. I guess I'm going to fail this test. Yeah. Good times. Woo! So that's how contrast effects can work in an experimental setting. Schemas also change the way new information is handled. Okay. Let's go back to confirmation bias, shall we? So you get new information in. You're like, hmm, is this new information good? That is, does it confirm my uh, worldview or my currently held beliefs? Or is it bad? Does it not confirm my worldview or previously held beliefs? That's that's important. That's important. Because confirmation bias is a bias, it's heuristical, so it's automatic. We do it without even thinking about it. Uh, and it's um, latched onto our schema generating machine, on our schema using machine. We're kind of stuck with it. And so we, lead, we, get, we get led down this inaccurate interpretation path, right? We look for or ignore all kinds of information. I think a good example of this is during is during the 2020 pandemic 
and all of the COVID-19 information that's coming out. And it's just like, wow, wow, wow. You know, um, you know, most people are thinking to themselves, I should trust the health experts on this one. But then you get um, the the anti-vaccination crowd who says 5G, uh, the new cellular technology is causing coronavirus. And you think to yourself, hmm, that sounds silly. It is because it doesn't. But to those people, any information that comes in about 5G not being connected to coronavirus they're like, nah, that's wrong. That's that's got to be wrong. That's f- funded by big government, big pharma, big sheep. I don't know. And so you end up with a situation where these people won't listen to really simple reason about how cellular and um, radio waves work. And then they're stuck in their little confirmation bubble. Okay, because their schemas about how the world works reinforces that 5G caused coronavirus. Okay, so just remember that the next time you get into a 5G doesn't conversation argument with somebody on the internet. Okay. More confirmation bias. We, 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 yeah, confirmation bias, gathering information, what sources do you get it from, um, tendency to seek evidence that fits rather than does not fit a hypothesis, which leads us to a good, uh, a good little tangent on, um, how scientists need to, uh, practice science which is not to confirm their hypotheses, but rather to seek information that disconfirms their hypotheses. That's really important. That's the whole nature of doing science, is is seeking to falsify the information that we already hold. Because if we try to falsify it and we do falsify it, then guess what? We've done science well. We've said, okay, so this information that we previously held to be true is no longer true, and so now I can change my beliefs. It's okay. It's okay to change your beliefs and to admit that you are wrong once. And it's okay to do that. Scientists do it all the time. This guy, the Band-Aid. Let's talk about a special case in social psych called the self-fulfilling prophecy. Okay. So this was general general generally from Rosenthal and colleagues, but a lot of people have been doing self-fulfilling prophecy uh research for the better part of the half the last half century. And so this one is specifically that schemas create the social reality that one tends to expect. So let me give you an example of this. Imagine you're a teacher you're a hard ass. Like this woman on the slide. Okay. So our expectations about teaching create the teaching social world that we live in. Okay. So the self-fulfilling prophecy, when we act on our impressions of that social world and how that relates to other people, In such a way that fosters the same exact behavior that we originally expected. So here's the example. You're a hard-ass teacher. And you have a belief about the world that says girls can't do math. This um, This is a bad stereotype. But it is a um, pervasive one. Which, by which I mean, it's widespread okay a lot of people think this so here we have two kids in her math class we have a girl and we have a boy okay what happens with the self-fulfilling prophecy vis-a-vis confirmation bias is that we give 
less time, less attention, and less assistance as the teacher to the girl. And we give more time, more attention, more assistance to the boy. What then happens? The prophecy has been fulfilled. C for the girl, A plus for the boy. Of course, <laughs> that girl can't do math. That girl cannot do math. Self-fulfilling prophecy. It's important to note here is that a self-fulfilling prophecy requires at least two people, the perceiver and the target. Okay, so in this example, the teacher is the perceiver and the girl and the boy are the two targets. But I mean, even if we don't include this boy in the situation and we just follow this track here, that's the target. That's the two people. It, uh, it's pretty gnarly. Self-fulfilling prophecies. Pretty, pretty, pretty gnarly. All right, metaphors. This is another way that we use the information that we have in our schemas to connect to seemingly unrelated concepts. Okay, these are metaphors. And so what you think about metaphors as a um, description of something in a literary sense, it's a similar thing, right? So the concept of warmth, for example, warmth. This is a conceptual, this is an abstract idea, warmth, when it uh, applies to humans. I am a warm human being as opposed to a cold human being. This has nothing to do with the temperature of my skin, which is the other meaning of warmth. That way we can do use the abstract concept of warmth in a physical sense. By taking something that's warm physically, this cup of coffee, and, and giving it to somebody and saying, oh, I think that person's more, more warm and more trustworthy. Great. Give them a cold glass of water, they'll think that person's colder and less trustworthy. However, and, and metaphors and object priming and these sorts of things are touch and go. There's a lot of studies out there that have have done this. I've been a part of few of them. Um, we've gotten the the effect that we hypothesized regarding the priming of the object or the concept in a metaphorical sense. But some of these aren't replicating. So are they real? Well, the idea behind metaphorical thinking and the connection between uh the connection between schemas is real i i i would say that is in it in and of itself real but we are missing key pieces of evidence to to bring the point home so just just keep that in mind when you're when you're hearing me talk about things uh, another research example is from Schnall, 2000, Schnall et al. 2008 um, with respect to the abstract concept of morality connected to cleanliness. You've probably heard the phrase cleanliness is next to godliness. And so replace godliness, which a lot of people think of as the highest form of morality possible. So that is clean is clean is moral. Dirty is immoral. OK, and so in this particular study. Uh, uh, participants uh, were were shown an environment, a work environment for a fictional person. You can see this environment sort of it. it's not it's not that visible here but it's kind of messy it's trash overflowing cluttered on the desk you know that sort of thing versus this individual in a clean office environment and they are asked the question 
is this person immoral or how immoral are they on a scale from one to seven? So the idea here is, yes, right and wrong, cleanliness, dirtiness, connected to morality. That's because religion has has a pervasive um, philosophy on this. But I do want you to recognize something very important about this scale and this graph, this figure. And I want you to apply this same thing for all subsequent figures that appear in your textbook or you see anywhere else, because this is not a good trick. Uh, it's a bad trick and it's it's naughty. So you can see here that this scale starts at five and ends at seven. So these two bars. Are within a two points, two points of one another, OK, so this is all two points. And so these two bars are even closer together. So if I would actually put this to scale and put this at a zero or whatever the bottom number of the scale was. It was probably one uh, uh, Likert type scale. So one to seven and then we just half increments here. Now, that doesn't look all that impressive, does it? It doesn't look all that impressive. How immoral <laughs> is this person on a scale from one to seven, seven being more immoral? Well, the, in the clean environment, they said this person is 5.5. That's higher than the midpoint of the scale versus just over, like maybe like 6.7. That's about a point away. So this is not a very um, illustrative example of metaphors, but I wanted to share it because it does have this bad news bears vibe associated with it it does not it does not look as good as this image or the findings aren't as good yeah sure these differences might be what is called statistically significant but is it practically important is it meaningful is it meaningful is are these people who rated this this average rating of 5.5 Moral? No, it's only when you compare it to this number, which is bigger. So that's very, it's an important idea. And that'll be it for this, um, this video. Please leave your comments, suggestions, and feedback down below. Until the next video, bye!